Hello everyone, this is Mr. Nobody bringing you something between an episode of Making Nobody Happy and a great literature reading. I actually just want to read you something from a book my father gave me uh, when I was younger called No Little People. It's one of the very specific things that he wanted to share with me. Um, I know it's something that he also shared with my brother. Uh, my brother is a doctor. Um, and my dad wanted to emphasize this to him because you see so many patients. And my dad was a doctor in a uh, small rural town, a little place. Um, and you might think, little people, and here am I, the great big important doctor, and not pay as much attention to each patient as you really should. And my dad uh, struggled against that attitude in himself, and he wanted to make sure from the outset that my brother didn't develop that attitude, and it's also something that he wanted to communicate to me. And it is a philosophy that has had an impact on me. It's also something that my mother really drove home to me throughout my life uh, with all kinds of things that she said to me. I'm not going to read the entire uh, chapter, which is the opening chapter, No Little People. And just, you know, these were all originally spoken sermons. So I'll try to read it. I don't have a Scottish uh, or... Um, would he have German accent, I think? Um, yeah, I think German accent. Uh, I don't have that, so you'll just have to have to hear it the way that I say it. And I'm going to start just a little ways into it. Francis Schaeffer begins, he's telling the story of the rod of Moses, which he says is just a stick. You know, Moses worked as a shepherd. Shepherds had their sticks that kept their sticks for a long time. It had probably been cut decades before just from, you know, some tree somewhere out in the wilderness. It was used to, you know, push the sheep around and give him support as he climbed around in the rocks and in the barren waste when he was just a nobody in particular. And then he goes to Egypt and the stick becomes this item of immense significance. The question is, was it the stick that was so important? Did the stick suddenly become so amazing that it has this... uh outsized place in culture and in the story said no it's not it's not that the stick suddenly changed or the stick was so different it's that it stopped being Moses's stick and it became God's stick so consider the mighty ways in which God used a dead stick of wood God so used a stick of wood can be a banner cry for each of us that we're limited and weak in talent physical energy and psychological strength we're not less than a stick of wood but as the rod of Moses had to become the rod of God, so that which is me must become the me of God. Then I can become useful in God's hands. The scripture emphasizes that much can come from little if the little is truly consecrated to God. There are no little people and no big people in the true spiritual sense, but only consecrated and unconsecrated people. The problem for each of us is applying this truth of ourselves. Is Francis Schaeffer the Francis Schaeffer of God? But if a Christian is consecrated, does this mean he'll be in a big place instead of a little place? The answer, the next step, is very important. As there are no little people in God's sight, so there are no little places. To be wholly committed to God in the place where God wants him, this is the creature glorified. In my writing and lecturing, I put much emphasis on God's being the, old, the infinite reference point which integrates the intellectual problems of life. He's to be this, but he must be the reference point not only in our thinking, but in our living. This means being what he wants me to be, being where he wants me to be. Nowhere more than in America are Christians caught in the 20th century syndrome of size. Size will show success. If I am consecrated, there will necessarily be large quantities of people, dollars, etc. This is not so. Not only does God say that size uh, and spiritual power go together, but even reverses these, especially in the teachings of Jesus, and tells us to be deliberately careful not to choose a place too big for us. We all tend to emphasize big works and big places, but all such emphasis is of the flesh. To think in such terms is simply to hearken back to the old, unconverted, egoist, self-centered me. This attitude taken from the world is more dangerous to the Christian than fleshly amusement or practice. It is the flesh. People in the world naturally want to boss others. Imagine a boy beginning work with a firm. He has a lowly place and he's ordered around by everyone. Do this, do that. Every dirty job is his. He's the last man on the totem pole, merely one of Rabbit's friends and relations, in Christopher Robin's terms. 
So one day when the boss is out, he enters the boss's office, looks around carefully to see no one's there, and then sits down in the boss's big chair. Some days, he says, I'll say run and they'll run. That is man. And let me just interject, I've seen this exact scenario play out. I was someone who was bullied a lot. I had a friend who was bigger than me and who did do some protecting of me, which I appreciated. And there was one time where he told me uh, he was upset, and I said, what are you upset? He said, well, I saw one of the bigger kids bullying this other little kid, and he was one of the few kids who was just as small as me. And he said, you know, and I, I helped him out, and I said, hey, don't do that. And then I saw that kid go over and start pushing around an even younger, smaller kid, and I was just, why did I just do that? Um, it's an instinct, you know? Uh, that is something that you see in life. Anyway, allow me to continue. <clears throat> and let us say with tears that a person does not automatically abandon this mentality when they become a Christian. In every one of us, there remains a seed of wanting to be boss, of wanting to be in control and have the word of power over our fellows. But the word of God teaches us we're to have a very different mentality. But Jesus called them, his disciples, to him and saith unto them, Ye know that they who are accounted to rule over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, and whoever of you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came, not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. Every Christian without exception is called into the place where Jesus stood, to the extent that we are called to leadership, we're called to ministry, even costly ministry. The greater the leadership, the greater is to be the ministry. The word minister is not a title of power, it's a designation of servanthood. There is to be no Christian guru. We must reject this constantly and carefully. A minister, a man who is a leader in the church of God, and never more needed than a day like ours when the battle is so great, must make plain to men, women, boys, and girls who come to places of leadership that instead of lording their authority over others and allowing it to become an ego trip, they're to serve in humility. Again, Jesus said, But be ye not called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. This does not mean there's not to be any order in the church. It, doesn't, it does mean that the basic relationship between Christians is not that of elder and people or pastor and people, but that of brothers and sisters in Christ. This denotes that there is one father in the family and that his offspring are equal. There are different jobs to be done, different offices to be filled. But we as Christians are equal before one master. We're not to seek a great title. We're to have the places together as brethren. When Jesus said, he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, he's not speaking in hyperbole or uttering romantic idiom. Jesus Christ is the realest of all realists, and when he says this to us, he's telling us something specific that we're to do. Our attitude towards all men should be that of equality, because we are common creatures. We are one blood and kind. As I look across all the world, I must see every man as a fellow creature, and I must be careful to have a sense of equality on the basis of this common status. We must be careful in our thinking not to try to stand in the place of God to other men. We are fellow creatures. And when I step from the creature to creature relationship into the brothers and sisters in Christ relationship within the church, how much more important to be a brother and sister to all who have the same father. Orthodoxy to a Bible-believing Christian always has two faces. It has a creedal face and a practicing face. And Christ emphasizes this is to be the case here. Dead orthodoxy is always a contradiction in terms, and clearly is so here. To be a Bible-believing Christian demands humility regarding others in the body of Christ. Jesus gave a tremendous example. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say well, for so I am. 
If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say to you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that is sent greater than he that has sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Note that Jesus says that if we do these things, there will be happiness. It's not just knowing these things that brings happiness, it is doing them. Throughout Jesus' teaching, these two words, know and do, occur constantly and always in that order. We cannot do until we know, and we cannot know without doing. The house built on the rock is the house of the man who knows and does. The house built on the sand is the house of the man who knows and but does not do. Christ washed the disciples' feet and dried them with the towel with which he was girded, that is, with his own clothing. He intended this to be a practical example of the mentality and action that should be seen in the midst of the people of God. Yet another statement of Jesus bears on our discussion. And he put forth a parable to those who were bidden when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, saying unto them, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, Give this man place. And thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Thou shalt have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Jesus commands Christians to seek consciously the lowest room, meaning the lowest place. All of us, pastors, teachers, professional religious workers, and non-professional included, are tempted to say, I'll take the larger place, because it will give me more influence for Jesus Christ. Both individual Christians and Christian organizations fall prey to the temptation of rationalizing this way, as we build bigger and bigger empires. But according to the scripture, this is backwards. We should consciously take the lowest place, unless the Lord himself extrudes us into a greater word, one. The word extrude is important here. To be extruded is to be forced out under pressure into a desired shape. Picture a huge press jamming soft metal at high pressure through a die so that the metal comes out in a certain shape. This is the way of the Christian. He should choose the lesser place and let, until God extrudes him into a position of more responsibility and authority. Let me suggest two reasons why we ought not to grasp the higher, larger place. First, we should seek the lower place because there it is easier to be quiet before the face of the Lord. I did not say easy. In no place, no matter how small or humble, is it easy to be quiet before God. But it's certainly easier in some places than in others. And the little places where I can more easily be close to God should be my preference. I'm not saying that it's impossible to be quiet before God in a greater place, but God must be allowed to choose when a Christian is ready to be extruded in such a place, for only he knows when a person will be able to have some quietness before him in the midst of increased pressure and responsibility. Quietness and peace before God are more important than any influence a position may seem to give, for we must stay in step with God to have the power of the Holy Spirit. If by taking a bigger place, our quietness with God is lost, then to that extent our fellowship with him is broken and we're living in the flesh. And the final result will not be as great, no matter how important the larger place may look in the eyes of other men or women or our own eyes. Always there will be a battle, always we will be less than perfect. But if a place is too big and too active for our present spiritual condition, then it is too big. We see this happen over and over again, and perhaps it's happened at some time to us. Someone whom God has been using marvelously at a certain place takes it upon himself to move into a larger place and loses his quietness with God. Ten years later, he or she may have a huge organization, but the power is gone. He's no longer a real part of the battle of their generation. The final result is not being quiet before God, of not being quiet before God is that less will be done, not more. No matter how much Christendom may be beating its drums or playing its trumpets for a particular activity. And that certainly does happen, doesn't it? So we must not go out beyond our depth. Take the smaller place so you have quietness before God. I'm not talking about laziness. Let me make that clear. 
That is something else, something too which God hates. I'm not talking about copping out or dropping out. God's people are to be active, not seeking on account of some false mystical concept to sit constantly in the shade of the rock. There's no removed monasticism in Christianity. We'll not be lazy in our relationship with God because when the Holy Spirit burns, a man is consumed. We can expect to become physically tired in the midst of our battle for our King and Lord. We should not expect all of life to be a vacation. We're talking about quietness before God as we are in his place for us. The size of the place is not important. The consecration of that place is. It must be noted that all these things, which are true for the individual, are true also for a group. A group can become activistic and take on responsibilities God has not laid upon it. For both the individual and the group, the first reason we are not to grasp, and the emphasis is on grasp, the larger place, is that we must not lose our quietness with God. The second reason why we should not seek the larger place is that if we deliberately and egotistically lay hold on leadership, wanting the drums to beat and the trumpets to blow, then we're not qualified for Christian leadership. Why? Because we've forgotten that we're brothers and sisters in Christ with other Christians. I've said on occasion there is only one good kind of fighter for Jesus Christ, the man who does not like to fight. The belligerent man is never the one to be belligerent for Jesus. And it is exactly the same with leadership. The Christian leader should be a quiet man of God who is extruded by God's grace into some place of leadership. We all have egoistic pressures inside us. We may have substantial victories over them, and we may grow, but we never completely escape them in this life. The pressure is always there, deep in my heart and soul, needing to be faced with honesty. These pressures are evident in the smallest of things as well as the greatest. I have seen fights over who is going to be president of a Sunday school class composed of three members. The temptation has nothing to do with size. It comes from a spirit, a mentality inside us. The person in leadership for leadership's sake is returning to the way of the world, like the boy dusting off his boss's chair and saying, someday I'll sit in it and I'll make people jump. One of the loveliest incidents in the early church occurred when Barnabas concluded that Paul was the man of the hour and then had to seek him out because Paul had gone back to Tarsus, his own little place. Paul was not up there nominating himself. He was back in Tarsus, even out of communication as far as we can tell. When Paul called himself the chief, chief of sinners, not fit to be an apostle, he's not speaking just for outward form's sake. From what he said elsewhere and from his actions, we can see this was Paul's mentality. Paul, the man of leadership for the whole Gentile world, was perfectly willing to be in Tarsus until God said to him, this is the moment. The people who receive praise from the Lord Jesus will not in every case be the people who hold leadership in this life. There will be many persons who are sticks of wood that stayed close to God and were quiet before him and were used in power by him in a place that looks small to men. Each Christian is to be a rod of God in the place of God for him. We must remember throughout our lives that in God's sight, there are no little people and no little places. Only one thing is important, to be consecrated persons in God's place for us at each moment. Those who think of themselves as little people in little places, if committed to Christ and living under his lordship in the whole of life, may by God's grace change the flow of our generation. And as we may get on a bit in our lives, knowing how weak we are, if we look back and see we have been somewhat used of God, then we should be the rod that was surprised by joy. Thanks. We'll see you next time.